my name is Rob Yannis, and as Carolina said, I'm one of the co-founders of System Change Alliance. And I'm very pleased today to have with us Joshua Konkanko and Adrian Brepke uh, from a program that they have developed. They're going to present some of these ideas today called the Systems Change Challenge. And, and as I told Adrian earlier, it's you know very similar to System Change Alliance. And so we feel like kindred spirits. And I'm also very excited about the topic, about the importance of weaving indigenous and modern perspectives to create system change towards a more equitable, thriving and resilient society. This to me, this very topic is so important today and, and goes to heart of what some of the main challenges we are dealing with today on our planet. So first, I would like to introduce Joshua Konkanko. He is an African elder from Cameroon in Africa. He is a social entrepreneur, experienced social movement builder, and he works on connecting technology and indigenous knowledge to create regenerative cultures and communities. And then we have with us Adrian Röpke, from, originally from Germany, but living in uh, Holland, as I understand. He's a network weaver and facilitator, supporting the emergence of resilient, thriving, and life-affirming uh, world. And uh, these days he's focused on building the capacity of multi-stakeholder networks to realize transformative, uh, the transformative impact that such networks can have. And together they have developed a dynamic and unique learning experience for individuals and collectives to accelerate systems change. And, and uh, uh, of course, they will talk more about that in detail. So I would like to open up this discussion and, and, and for each one of you to present your own perspective and how you got into this work. But from the perspective of the importance of the knowledge of the indigenous people, because without indigenous cultures and indigenous people as custodians of the natural world, we are toast. Second, we are living in a technological world. We are doing this on Zoom. We need to deal with technology. So how can we create the proper technology that supports nature, supports indigenous cultures, and at the same time, you know, move forward in, in the way that we think of uh, the modern world. So maybe each one of you could talk a little bit about that interconnection and, and how that uh, relates to the work that you're doing. Adrian, go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to uh, invite Kron Kanko. Okay. Um, we live in the 21st century called a digital uh, community already. This, the fact that we are already meeting here on Zoom is proof that the indigenous uh, is continuously being separated from what we call development or civilization. So in my understanding, we will need a different kind of change leaders uh, to be able to make this new way of community building. It will not be politicians as far as I see not even economists, because everything has been digitalized in a scientific way. But at the same time, there is a calling for reconnecting with nature. And this, the indigenous people hold, in fact, they are still living, they are the natural beings. I'll give you a simple example. 
that people in my community feel that it's a privilege, a privilege to eat with your fingers because you come in contact with where you come from, from the food. And food still represents the love economy. The scientists have not reflected to see why, despite slavery, despite colonization, economic deprivation, social deprivation, the Africans, especially the indigenous ones, are still resilient. So what uh, came to connect and already is creating impact is when technology is our extension of creation, when it meets creation, which is nature, then the miracles start to happen. I think this is the lesson of COVID. So these new change leaders have to go through a different kind of challenge. So there are people with new ideas, projects, really responding to the daunting problems of racism, economic inequality, and climate change. These are the kind of people that we see as the leaders of tomorrow. So the future will be created by young people because they own the future, because they are still young, they have the energy, they have the education, they have the talents. And so they need to be connected with this indigenous knowledge that the, the, the people living at the grassroots still have. Otherwise, the world will be completely, it will disintegrate because without connecting with what has created us, we are solely depending on what we, we are creating. And it's a fallacy because we can now see where we find ourselves in today's world. And these kind of issues and the trauma that we are all in can be resolved easily by the knowledge that the indigenous people, the wisdom that the indigenous people still hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. Um, you mentioned the importance of young people, and I think I would agree with that. At the same time, as you were saying, the importance of indigenous people and indigenous elders like yourself, I think that that combination is so important. Young, young people can bring a lot to the table, but at the same time, we need to preserve and utilize the knowledge of indigenous people such as yourself. So can you tell me a little bit about your background uh, from Africa, what kind of community you come from, and if there are any examples of, of thriving indigenous communities there? Yeah. I am one of the lucky few that I was initiated at a very young age into the Council of Elders, mm -hmm. because it is believed that if the young, all groups in the society are not incorporated in the way we construct the community, some will burn it down just to feel its warmth, because the love is when everything is together. The, that is what we consider economy, that power. Oh, some people have even said the power of love. This is what life is all about. So this initiation gave me a different kind of education from what my peers had. At that time, we were in colonization. So it was the Christians or the missionaries who brought their own kind of education saying you have to deny your name, you have to deny your culture. In fact, you have to deny your own self, your own cultural identity. And as we know, if you take away the culture of the people, then you take away their soul. They are no longer living, they become zombies. Um, so this kind of, um, it, it was just one week in the spiritual forest. And, the, that knowledge that the elders transmitted to us was very simple. And it was that the community is this spiritual forest because in the spiritual forest, you find food. In the spiritual forest, 
you hear the birds singing, you hear the river running through and all those natural rhythms. Everything is connected to everything. This kind of knowledge I have never seen, heard in school, or oh, that I am the tree, or oh, I am the, the root cassava that we find in the forest to eat, or oh, the fruit, or oh, the bird. Because this is what we are. We are the earth. And all these things, the water, the rock, all these things are interconnected. So the spirit of interbeing was already instilled into the young people to understand the cosmos. For us, the spiritual forest, although very limited at the time, was the world. But it's also how we conceive the cosmos. Because everything is interconnected. The air, the water, this is all what we consider to be community. They are all part of life. So by div dividing, like science starts to put everything in a box. I can give you another example that the education that I have, uh, that I had completely uprooted me from my roots. But because I was initiated, so this kind of spiritual right, or right of passage, mm -hmm. as we call it today, that reconnects you, actually makes you have a different consciousness as you go through life. And this probably is what still exists in where I come from. Where I come from is called Bafut. It's a, a traditional village that has lived through ages because it also easily connected with the rest of the world. There is a book for people who know English that was written about Bafut. It's called Bafut Beagles. You can look it up. It was written by Gerard Durel. And he started the first zoo in my village in West Africa. Well, the country called Cameroon, that's another story because Cameroon is West Africa, it is East Africa, it's Central Africa, because it's actually also the center of Africa. So in this small triangle where you have the whole of Africa in miniature, there is a lot that can be said about the heart of Africa coming from that spot, from, from Bafut. They, 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 Ex being exposed to the English and getting that culture at a very early stage meant that they started to connect. If you look up and you see the Bafut Palace, the Germans fought and could not defeat the Bafut people because of their spiritual strength. They helped to construct the palace. So when you have Western technology and traditional systems. We have the oldest grass house still standing in West Africa. So these are the things that we can begin to look at when we talk about resilience and look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which really clearly say they have to be partnership. Partnership does not mean inclusiveness. We have developed now an alliance of systems so we can invite the Africans this is an example of co-creation that I can see here in, in this Zoom room. And this is the way that the African communities were created. And supposedly this is how science was supposed to be created. But science created these systems of top-down, which we are now dealing with. It's, it's traumatic how we can continue in the same direction. So connecting things is what the, the education that we, we are trying to develop is all about. And when, when we are struggling to demonstrate the social or socio-ecological interdependence of all life for it to be sustainable and to be resilient, because it's also about co-evolution. This is the way the world has always evolved. So the people, where I come from and the people all over the world, they have all the elements that they need for the kind of sustainable education that we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, Adrian, so you're working with uh, Joshua, and can you speak about how, how you met and, and how you uh, collaborate and a little bit about your own background and, and interest in, in this intersection between technology and indigenous uh, knowledge? Yeah, sure. I will roar. So we met uh, two years ago at a conference called uh, Defend the Sacred, which was a way to bring together a lot of different movements and activists from all over the world um, who work on the intersection of developing consciousness uh, and also being very active, proactive in the world. And when I saw him, it really clicked. I was very uh, intrigued um, and, and very curious about his, his cultural um, background um and his story and and that's when we started to create deeper trust and and weave our own own relationships and through many conversations we kind of then arrived at this idea okay how can we bring this traditional knowledge that Konkanku was speaking to so so powerfully around that nature is completely interdependent that in fact we are nature um how to build uh, com resilient communities, um, how to also mature as a human being through these rites of passage um, and parts in my my upbringing and education that that point to the same thing because I've been trained also in, in systems thinking, um, in thinking how can we look at the problems of today in a way that's interconnected. The climate crisis is interwoven with social inequity that we see today. Um, and we also, our response needs to come from a place that's based on moving things into the right relationships. And this is where this concept was, was born. And, and it's not just on this idea level, but it's really on, on uh, our ways of being, you know, like I'm this young, a guy from Germany who is like also socialized to go quite fast and all of these things. And then when I work with Konkanko, we just, we have a different rhythm because he's, he's gardening and, you know, like in a, in a slower pace. So the indigenous and modern comes together, not only on this level of ideas and practices actually, but also in a, in a way of being. And this is how we reconnect our inner, um, our inner experience with what is happening in the world. And um, yeah, I just feel fundamentally that building bridges across different cultures, across different generations, across different ideas is absolutely critical um, in these times because we are facing um, massive climate disaster. You know, there's tipping points in, in our ecological systems and they come from this mindset of separation of being separated from ourselves, of separating from others, of separating from nature. And we can, through collaboration, uh, create um, systems that serve life, that are life affirming, instead of based on domination, instead of being based on, on greed. And this is our big hope, uh, our big ambition with this project to collaborate um, on an unprecedented scale to create a more thriving world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're talking about uh, extinction. So we have species extinction. At the same time, we have cultural extinction and linguistic extinction. Thousands of languages are disappearing as indigenous cultures are being destroyed. So, you know, we don't need to focus too much on that. We all know about these incredible destructions that are going on on the planet. So <clears throat> share with me uh, how you are thinking we can turn this chain of events around so that we can create a more resilient and just world. How can we, and, and, and your own thinking about how we can bring in the, this very much needed indigenous knowledge, indigenous cultures, because this is where we come from. This is where we know how to harmonize between human culture and nature. We are part of nature. So what is your vision for how to co-create that change? So, so um, 
One piece is around realizing that there are already a lot, a lot of movements out there. So we have viable alternatives in all areas of human life. We have different economic models. We have different political models, all of this. The, the problem is that they are still fragmented, right? And that's where also the, the weaving, the connection comes in. So I feel personally how deep um, transition processes work is there is a current dominant system right which is neoliberal capitalism colonialism patriarchy all of these pieces and that's declining because we're rapidly meeting the planetary boundaries it's not working for the health of the planet and, and humans and at the same time we see the the emergence of all of these new ways of doing and being right and th that i that i spoke to and now the question is how can we come together as these movements come together across cultures and get also very pragmatic about this you know like not stay stuck in our heads and these grand visions but really move it to the ground and find adaptive resilient ways to build community to implement projects together and to do this really on the ground um so that is my my perspective i'd love to hear uh Konkanko. yeah yes Konkanko, please uh so from an African perspective, every place has a spirit, like we say, the spirit of place. Every, be it a forest, be it a river, it's like a soul. And so this kind of spirit are like acupuncture points that meet along certain song lines to produce manifestations, could be in a healthy way or in a destructive way. So to bring things to harmony, we know from people who have made great achievements in life, if you look at a simple symphony that is appealing to the, to the ear, it's because all the song lines are aligned in a certain rhythm that flow with nature. Most art comes from nature. Our spirit, the great sculptures sometimes that we worship, are made by artists, our sculptors are inspired in the forest. Most musicians, most artists, painters, they spend time in nature, listening to the rhythms. I think some other great prophets have said that there is always a silent message flowing and those who are initiated to that will be able to resonate and create harmony. So the systems we have created are accelerating things out of the natural rhythm of life. You can watch a tree, you don't see how it grows. But from little acorns, you find mighty oaks, you don't see that happen. You even have a child that you are raising the child and you see certain manifestation. The child falls down, not the, the nose, bleeding, but doesn't stay there. The child gets up and keeps on pushing with life at a certain rhythm, not forced, but because there is something that is beyond our human understanding. Maybe in, an, in a modern way, some people will say it's mysticism, but this is what we believe in, in the indigenous cultures. We believe in mystery. What happens? It's like the clouds coming over the moon, shedding the light, and then suddenly light appears in the morning. How do these things happen? When you are then, initiated in a way that you can tune in 
into these forces. For me, I think this is the greatest education that one can have. And then we can then use this power of nature to create things which are good for hum the human. Because what we are spending time in the mad rat, rat race, you know, to create wealth. Wealth is life, it's always there. But by accelerating to create wealth, what we are doing is using the natural resources of life to barricade ourselves from the opportunities of life. So it becomes maybe from a Western point of view, we need to go back to the drawing box because normally the way life moves, the river is flowing, it never flows backward. What we are, we are not saying that we should go and live in the stone age because some people are regarding or what they call the less developed or the underdeveloped as primitive. And they, they think that by completely cutting themselves off from what, I'll give an example like during COVID, free things like oxygen are now being sold. We have to always create machines that will sell the, the natural things that are given to us for free. If you tell somebody in my village that they buy water, you say that is sacrilege because this is what we use to pour libation, to appease life and water is life. How can you sell life? Who gives man the authority to sell life? We haven't even understood. Yeah so much about our own systems that we are selling them, accelerating yeah. the selling. Yeah, this is so true. And, and this is, uh, I think, goes to the heart of some of the problems we are experiencing today. I was just watching a, a documentary recently about Nestle building a water factory in, in Africa and selling the water in bottles to people living in, in the city and, and the villages nearby didn't have proper drinking water. So this, this is the unfortunate situation we have come to. And I, I think that Adrian summarized this situation very well by saying that we are experiencing two curves, one curve that is going down, which is the neoliberal uh, throwaway society that is based on consumption and commodification of nature and the human spirit. And at the same time, there is this counter movement which represents system change, the system change movement. And that's what System Change Alliance is all about as well. That is going in, in a different direction, but at the same time, hopefully bringing with it the knowledge that Konkanku is representing, the knowledge of the indigenous cultures. And at the same time, coupling that with appropriate technology. Um, David Brower, one of the great American environmentalists had a saying, which I think is very important. Every new invention is guilty until proven innocent. In other words, we need to think a hundred times before we put something out there on the market. We can, nowadays we're just producing something creating something and if it makes a buck and, and profit, it becomes marketable. And that's why one of the main reasons I think we are in this uh, situation we're in. So we're getting uh, towards the end of, of this discussion and I want to open it up for, for questions to, to Adrian and uh, Kunkanku, uh, if you have any questions. While we're maybe gathering some of the questions, maybe Adrian, in a very succinct way, you can share a little bit about the system change challenge that you and Konkanku have developed, what that is all about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that also goes into what I wanted to do, namely to also connect that to 
the people who, are, who, are, who have gathered in this room, right? Because then we can always get lost in these big idealist yeah. problems, like the big idealist visions or the problems. And I personally yeah. find it very, very overwhelming to, to live in this time, right? And to navigate, um, to navigate, like to find out how can I act with integrity? How can I use my life's energy to like like serve and like to contribute right and i think a lot of people um have these questions like what are we gonna do about this like how can i contribute and uh, the systems change challenge is a six-week program that basically helps um to do that so we have a very small um exploration with just uh, 10 to 12 people all from different cultures and there's two editions of that. So the first one is the Firestarter edition, where it's this is for people who have an idea, right? Oh, I want to create a specific change in my local environment, but I don't know how to implement it, right? So that that uh, the Firestarter edition is then helping you through coaching, through peer support, through this community that we're creating to make this project more concrete and to actually get going with it. Like you work on the project while you, um, while we do the challenge. And the other um, edition is the Earth Guardian uh, edition, which is for people who already have more established projects. So you're coordinating already with a lot of different people. And that is then to really help you scale um, your impact. So work with all of your different uh, stakeholders in that sense. Um, I think Carolina can, can also drop in the the, the website where there's more information about that and yeah ultimately we're just searching together for for ways to create a more thriving world and to also relate that to ourselves and find agency in that and and really be of service in this critical um moment of the human story yeah great wonderful so um uh, please raise your hand if you if you want to say something or you can write um your uh, question in the chat as well. Elizabeth uh, wanted to say something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a contradiction in using this technology and talking about connection with nature? I mean, how did we, how did we get to this technology? We had to have fossil fuels. We had to destroy the earth. So in a way, it's a contradiction here that we're using this technology and yet talking about nature. That's my mm -hmm. comment. Okay. Would you like to I address mean, that? Either one of you? Konkanku or, or Adrian? I can go. What is, what is it about that contradiction? Well, we know that in life, everything appears contradictory and yet at the same time makes a lot of sense. In my introduction, I was already talking about everything is connected to everything and everything is everything. So in a way, we have used tone as technology. If you look at the evolution of man, technology is an extension. It's probably also the mission of the human to for those maybe who are biblical, it depends how we look. There are so many frames to look at the things. If we look at it a bit from a certain frame, um, some people uh, have said that uh, the reason we are here is to continue the, the work of the creator. He has given us that spirit. We do have, we are God. So just like the stone is a God, just like technology could also be a God. This is why we have to look at it as the things that are there to serve life and not to go against life. This is where the contradictions come from. Well, this is a little bit how I can give an insight. So it's about wisdom and not just knowledge because most of the time we intellectualize, romanticize, and then we are not listening. It's really about deep listening to align with the knowledge that is 
because everything is, and it's neither bad nor good. Everything has two sides. This is why we navigate through certain song lines in order to create harmony. This is the, the, the difficulty in understanding the contradiction. Thank you. Um, Godert is next. I hope I pronounced your name properly. It's almost right. It's uh, Godert in Dutch. I am uh, I'm Godert, a big fan okay. of... Uh, oh, you can hear me? I'm a big fan of Adrian. We work together in Tilburg, transition, down, transition movement in Tilburg. And I mentioned uh, several uh, movies and things. I uh, and actually I'm involved in uh, a very beautiful project, which exactly uh, addresses the, the the project that Joshua mentioned. It's, it's about uh, a guy who is uh, creating new economy as a center for new economy. It's called Henry Manting, and he's going with a wheelbarrow to Paris to uh, to 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 uh, ring the bell at UNESCO headquarters to say the whole earth needs to be safe, not only the windmills in Holland or the nature's things. And he's also working with the best people in the world, with uh, with John Lee, for instance, with Eco Restoration Camp, with uh, a beautiful man, Rolf Winters, about uh, indigenous leadership, uh, made a beautiful film about uh, traveling uh, with his with his children to several wisdom keepers and uh, the Kifa I, I mentioned some in, in personal and I think it's it's a beautiful movie and for instance just to mention one thing there's also a camel called Einstein coming with the with the with the with the uh, pilgrimage to, and then she's uh, she the camel is guided by a woman who went on a bike to Mongolia and fell in love with the camels there. And she's just now, re recently now, as we speak, only lives with a camel and walking with this camel with a backpack, with a tent on her back. And she's joining the pilgrimage and there are more stories to tell, but I think this, this is the perfect match. And this is exactly what Joshua uh, mentions. And uh, the ambition is also to, uh, to, uh, to collect, uh, you can collect uh, a, a spoon of earth from your own garden and you can send it. And the ambition is to, to have a spoon of earth from every country in the world. And we are going to have a ceremony in a, in a rich castle from a rich designer where all uh, indigenous people will come to celebrate uh, the end of the journey. So it's 45 days of traveling with lots of footage and lots of filming I, I will do the filming one. I'm one of the filmers and it's going to be a perfect uh, project. And it's all, yeah, it will, it will. I love that, that Joshua or for some reason maybe, maybe can join or other people. So I'm just, uh, I'm very happy to. Thank to you. Imagine. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to share something that Danielle wrote. She says, uh, it's how we also use and define technology the branch of knowledge that deals with the creation and the use of technological means and their interrelation with life, society, and the environment. And I think, I think what she's saying that is, is so true. Uh, this interrelationship and finding that dynamic balance between what is what we think of as nature, culture, and, and economics, and, and, uh, and all of that. That to me is whole systems thinking and we need to create change so that all of these relationships, nature, spirit, society, economy, science, all of these are working together in dynamic harmony. Um, any other comments or questions? We have a couple of, we have three more minutes here. Uh, feel free to to ask or, or make a comment. Uh, otherwise, I, I will give uh, the mic to uh, to Adrian or Konkanku to say a few more words about their work and uh, maybe a little bit more about the system change challenge. So people can get in touch with you on, on the website, which is in the chat. Uh, is there anything else you would like to share before we close, Adrian? Yeah, I also got my mail into the chat. Um, how about Tim? You, you have a question? 
Oh yes, uh, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was curious um, if you could just kind of give a, an example of how you would see that the practice of weaving itself is is you is different when it is informed by an integration of indigenous and modern perspectives in comparison to a practice of weaving that might uh, miss that integration if you know what i mean okay great question so i think for context or for people who don't know what what weaving is i think to me at least it's it's about creating relationships right so not for example networking for ourselves but connecting people connecting ideas connecting projects um and what comes to mind is like when we weave from a perspective which is more this indigenous view the right that life is fundamentally interconnected anyways then it's um a lot less uh, stressful because we can we can tune into the underlying current of like the tapestry of life that's there already you know and we're not here is life and we are here and trying to weave people together from from the outside but we are actually embedded in this tapestry of life and just um create like make connections more visible like we're just tuning into the networks that are already there and making them uh, them more thriving so i think it's uh, it's it's a lot um more at ease with with how life flows if we bring in the indigenous uh, perspective and uh yeah I, I think my last words would be to to really say that we are the the ones that we've been waiting for you know like we are living at this time and i know covid and the other crises are overwhelming us and it's very difficult um but with strength and with grace and and with really solidarity and community we can move beyond that and i really wish that we come together as a humanity and move through these uh, challenges together that's that would be my my last words and i thank all of you for for showing up and i would love to uh, be in touch in the systems change challenge or otherwise um thanks Thank you, Adrian, and thanks, Tim, for that, that question. Uh, finally, Danielle uh, wrote something in the chat about an organization that she's involved in that transforms uh, food systems based on indigenous knowledge. So please uh, check that out in the chat. So um, I would like to thank every one of you for coming and joining us today in this uh, wonderful discussion. And I would like to invite all of you to join the System Change Alliance to get involved um, with our conferences coming up. We are uh, right now working on um, different ideas and, and mapping how we can create system change in different areas. And uh, this is very exciting work. We need volunteers and we need uh, people to get involved. So please stay in touch and, uh, and get involved with, with our work. On behalf of uh, System Change Alliance, I would like to thank you all for coming and joining us. And thank you, Adrian and uh, Konkanku for your wonderful uh, contributions to this work and the uh, importance of global systems change.